great. Um, so basically, today I will be talking about the relationship between, or let's say the space between a designer's initiative when it comes to procedural calling generation and the player's experience. Now, I'm sure by now you all know, or most of you know what PCG is and the details of it and so on. So I'm not going to bore you with those details today. I'm just focusing on that part of procedural code generation, the place where designers meet uh, gameplay, let's say models or predictors of gameplay experience. So a bit about myself. Um, I work at the Institute of Digital Games at the University of Malta, as, or, as Amy already uh, mentioned. I've been working with uh, quite a few people in that area, procedural content generation, for the last decade or so. I've been um, writing books about it with Julian Dogelians, for instance, um, a recent book on artificial intelligence and games. And um, if you need a good uh, basic reading about procedural content generation, of course, you have the textbook, the edited volume on procedural content generation, but you also have chapter four of that book of artificial intelligence games that you can start reading about. Um, I will be talking about some sections of that chapter related to mixed initiative uh, PCG and experience driven PCG today. I also, I'm part of Model AI, as Julian is, and um, uh, as other people uh, that have been participating, as Niels, for instance, have been participating in this uh, um, uh, summer school. Uh, and I wear both hats, but today I'm going to, wear, to be wearing my academic hat. And I'll be talking about the fact that, uh, you know, ways that games can help us make better, uh, sorry, AI can help us make, make better games, but not necessarily through, through game agents. And I'm sure by now you all have been convinced um, this is a PC, PCG workshop after all, that there are ways we can utilize AI in particular roles so we can make better games. And, um, and the three main roles that we have identified with Julian, you can see them in this sort of uh, graph here of AI within, within games. Uh, you, you can see them in, uh, you know, in, in this sort of... Um, uh, graph with three main um, uh, activities for AI that we meet. Well, there are more, but these are the main, uh, the, the three main uh, roles that we, we, we could identify. And uh, of course, one of them is to generate content or generate complete games or parts of games. The other obvious uh, role is to play games. And of course, uh, the third one is uh, the ability of AI to model, understand, and um, sort of uh, express emotion and behavior of players. Now, I will not be focusing on playing games, which is arguably the traditional use of AI in games, but more today I will be talking about modeling players and of course content generation and their interplay when it comes to meeting designers, when it comes to modeling players and so on. So instead of talking, for, uh, talking about a particular application of PCG within games like Amy did before with Hearthstone. I will be mostly covering, uh, you know, the, the high level sort of uh, relationship between the two modeling and generation through a number of different examples uh, solely on generation of content on modeling players and uh, uh, in their relationship between them. And um, when we talk about content generation, obviously, uh, and when we talk about procedural content generation, um, you've met definitions already. I'm sure you know what it is. So this is just a refresher slide with one of my favorite sort of uh, examples of PCG, um, of academic examples that they actually made into an actual game, which is Yavalath. Um, maybe you, you're already introduced to it, possibly from Julian, um, within a search-based, let's say, PCG paradigm. What, uh, what I present here is the game itself and the very simple sort of uh, ev evolved grammar that actually describes, represents the game. Um, there's an evolutionary strategy that actually has generated the game name, has generated a number of players, the, the type of board, which is tiling hex, uh, save hex, the size five here that you see, 
and uh, the winning and losing conditions, which is, you know, you win if you have four in a row, four tokens in a row, uh, or you lose if you have three, three tokens in a row. So it's one of my favorite sort of examples of uh, what computational creativity can deliver in a game, a game that actually has won um, game design awards. And uh, these are the, the, the sort of things that I will be talking about, not necessarily in an autonomous way. This Yavala has been generated by Ludi. Ludi is a program uh, uh, that was designed by Cameron Brown. So one could think of um, a generation process as Cameroon designing Ludi and then Ludi designing Yavalath in a somehow sort of um, autonomous way. I will be talking about ways where we can actually integrate experience in that process and the experience of the player, which is in part integrated here because there are fitness functions that they represent depth, let's say, in the game. So experience is part of depth. But uh, I will also be talking about tools that can actually help you build in collaboration, in a creative dialogue with the machine. You can build uh, things like Yavala. Um, and of course, the problem, the need of procedural content generation is the very fact that content costs, that games are, they have an end, and we might not really like that. And obviously, they have bounds, and our human imagination is quite limited, and our cre creativity is limited. Uh, it's quite vast, actually, but uh, of course, it can be augmented through machines in a, in a creative dialogue. And obviously, the design is all, not always present, so we need machines to be able to uh, do things for us. So um, here I have a slide. Most of these things by now you must have seen uh, already. Things like Speed Tree, uh, and um, or you have played Borderlands, for instance, uh, generation of weapons, the level generation in Civilization. K. Krieger is a first-person shooter, only generated uh, using 96 kil kilobytes of memory, which is impressive. And you have Minecraft and so on. Spelunky here level generation. Um, PCG existed in, in, exists in industry for the last 30 years or so. It is only us recently, academics, that we discovered that uh, we can do interesting things with creative, with computational creativity within games. And uh, came up with a number of taxonomies and uh, to actually try to explain and study this phenomenon of procedural content generation. So, um, not sure if Julian or other um, speakers actually um, presented this to you, but um, there's a number of different taxonomies of procedural content generation that one meets in the literature. Uh, the one we came up with with Julian, uh, you can see over here. Uh, you have three types here. You have three, uh, let's say, main blocks. You have the content block, you have the method block, and the role block. Within content, you meet optional versus necessary content. Necessary content, let's say, is um, there are the rules of the game or the levels enter the levels. Optional content could be more or less anything else, depending on the game, of course. Then you have, uh, within the method, you meet uh, determinism, uh, which sort of varies between completely stochastic methods over completely deterministic methods. Then you have controllability, methods that basically are controlled, they are easy to control, uh, such as, let's say, uh, L systems or uh, nor controllable, uh, such as um, evolutionary computation methods. You have iterativity, which is basically divides the methods, the procedural content generation methods into constructive, which is a traditional old fashioned way of, of generating content in, in the industry, which takes a piece of content or a method, basically generates a piece of content without really evaluating it, but making sure that it has, it's actually playable uh, within some constraints, let's say, and constructs it once, and then, uh, you know, it goes, here it goes. Whereas you have generate and test, on the other hand, you have generate and test methods that basically make sure that whatever is generated is actually playable, or it's fun, or it actually meets some constraints that are um, necessary. Within the generate and test paradigm, you meet things like search-based procedural content generation, or later on, as I will be talking about the experience-driven procedural content uh, generation uh, framework. But today, I'm not going to talk about all this, but I will rather focus on the role of procedural content generation, uh, and in particular about the autonomy of PCG and 
the experience angle, let's say, of PCG. Autonomy varies from completely autonomous systems to mixed initiative systems, and experience varies from completely experience agnostic systems, uh, generative systems that completely ignore whatever the player is doing or wh wh whatever the player feels, uh, all the way to experience driven systems that really consider the experience of the player. So the first one I call um, computational game creativity and the second sort of uh, dimension I call the experience driven PCG. Now it is important to remember when it comes to content in games, there are several different facet facets that we have identified with Adonis, Lapis, and uh, Julian. Um, in particular, we identified six of them uh, that you see over here. Visuals that can be anything from photorealistic to abstract visuals um, or sketches. Uh, audio that can be anything from sound effects to complete sort of uh, orchestrated music. Uh, narrative could be anything from dialogue to complete books. Uh, gameplay, creative gameplay, actually can be considered a facet of creativity within games. We meet fascinating ways, actually, that players do play games in, in, in ways that has, have, have not been sort of imagined. So the very fact that we play games in so many different ways and beyond out of the box, actually, uh, makes gameplay itself as a creative act. Um, then... Obviously, you meet the rules of the game, the creation of, uh, of a rule-based system that um, makes the game. Uh, it is, it is a, it's a creative task on its own right, of course. And uh, finally, level generation is, uh, is the most popular um, facet of uh, generative systems within games. And um, now, if you, if you try to think of all this sitting together and uh, being orchestrated in a way that actually generates the ultimate experience for the player, whatever that is, uh, then we are talking about a very, very hard problem, the, the complete generation of a game that features some of these facets here and orchestrates all these facets. And I'll be talking about orchestration later on. Uh, it's, it's quite a fascinating and challenging task. Um, so... In a sense, today I will be covering these two uh, dimensions that you see in this graph. Uh, on one dimension, we have the player experience, and on the other dimension, we have the designer initiative. And obviously, um, when we ignore the experience and we also ignore the designer uh, during the creation process as a, as a computational uh, method, then we are talking about you know, autonomous experience agnostic systems and we meet uh, several of them in the literature and in the, in the industry, commercial standard uh, systems. And uh, I will be showing you a few of them before I'm, I jump into the experience-driven and mixed initiative events. So let me share some examples from my work uh, with others throughout the years, some indicative examples of autonomous generation. Um, so, so what do you see here? And I hope you are able to see this. Just some feedback would be appreciated. If you can actually see this well, or if it's lagged, let me see. It's a little laggy. One of it's very laggy here. Oh, right. Hmm. So, right. So let me pause this then. How did I do that? Okay. So I'll try to play this once more and try to pause it in some indicative. Yeah, it's a big video and my internet here is not great. So. All right. Oh. Okay. So basically what we did here, and you can't really see the, the video very well, but what you, but the idea, the underlying idea here is to be able to generate a first person shooter uh, level based on a number of well-defined designer criteria um, that, um, that we met in the literature about uh, first person shooter level design. 
So we visit the literature about, about patterns, design patterns that we often meet in, the, in these levels and in this, in this type of games. And uh, okay. Right. Will it help if I remove my video, maybe? Hmm. Let's try with my video off, because you've seen me already. You know how I look. So let's see if we can remove my stop video from here. Let's try this again. Now you give me feedback again. How about now? Still very laggy, okay, right. Right, so, well, this is what we have to do. We can live with, we should live with. Um, I'm, I'm very sorry, I'm on a remote island, uh, on a remote island in Greece, in a village, and that's the best thing that I could find. I think it works. <laughs> Uh, I have like two videos, um, but I can explain what's going on without actually showing the video. This is a recording, I see, interesting. Right, let me see if that is the correct video. Yeah, great, thanks for finding that, cool. And that's the correct video, so you can actually, you can actually see it from there. Um, so let me see how do I get back to this. Here, okay. Zoom around the connection itself, okay. All right, I'll do that. That sounds like a good idea. All right, I'll do it later once, once the, um, the presentation is done. All right. So let me skip this video once and for all, because you can't really see it well. So yeah, so the idea is that uh, we're we are looking at um, um, okay, sorry, it's, it's many things here. Right. So we went to the literature, we looked at things that uh, we could um, we could identify as design patterns for, uh, for, for first-person shooters, and then we use those as fitness function in evolutionary process so that we generate first-person shooters that have, let's say, you know, large arenas where you can actually shoot each other, you, can, you have sniping positions uh, where you can actually uh, wait and, uh, and shoot at others, you have a fair distribution of resources over the level, and so on. And of course, you have two rooms, two floors. You have uh, the placement of staircases at the, the right positions so that you can actually navigate well and so on. So this is an example of an autonomous uh, generation of content uh, using handcrafted fitness functions in games in a, in a sort of multi-objective uh, fashion uh, or just an aggregation of fitness functions. Um, okay. Now, I would like to to tell you about, before I continue, I'll just um, a brief refresher or just introduction to some of you of what uh, Novelty Search is, because I will be using it quite a lot later on, uh, which is basically an evolutionary computation process that rewards the average distance from other individuals, but um, it, it basically doesn't, doesn't uh, use a particular fitness function as an objective, as usual, uh, as a usual uh, fashion that we do in, in evolutionary computation, but instead it rewards the, the distance from other individuals. So it, it basically rewards the novelty of a behavior from other population members. It also maintains an archive for past novel solutions, so it tries to deviate itself from things that has seen in the past, it has generated in the past. In terms of procedural content generation, you can imagine it as levels that... Uh, the generated self hasn't really generated before, right? So maximum diversity, let's say, or maximum novelty from past solutions. Now, you can, of course, 
create a constrained version of novelty search. And uh, as, a, as a result, you can have, let's say, a feasible solution space here, and then an infeasible solution space. And by feasible solution space, it could be, let's say, the playable levels that you generate versus the unplayable levels. Um, you can apply, let's say, constrained novelty search, which means that within the feasible space, you're actually trying to maximize novelty, whereas within the feasible space, you're actually trying to push individuals towards the feasibility space. So you can apply some form of, let's say, two population evolution uh, computation process and achieve really interesting results as um, the following, um, which is, has nothing to do with constrained novelty search, of course, but it has to do with what we call in, um, what we call in uh, creative, in the creative process in human creativity, the iterative, iterative refinement. So when it comes to human creativity for the last, uh, let's say, you know, thousands of years, what you see here actually is, uh, is an image from, um, uh, Persia, from Persepolis. And what you see here is the iterative process of uh, human creativity. Um, you have three different designers, three different artists that are carving the stone. So you have the first designer, the first artist actually carving the sketch of the stone here. Now the second artist is actually putting some more details and the third one is finalizing and polishing the, the statue. Um, we were inspired by this process, and it actually happens all over the, all over the human uh, history and human creativity, and we're inspired by this process, and we integrated that process alongside constrained novelty search into a system that we called uh, Delanox. We coupled iterative refinement, as I described it before, with uh, iterative complexity as well. So the idea was to combine novelty search with deep learning. So we actually allowed um, a spaceship generator, let's say, to generate millions of, of spaceships, simple spaceships at the beginning. The generator itself was represented by a neural network. Then um, we would actually read all these images through deep autoencoders, and we'll try to, th these are the feature planes of the deep autoencoders in the first step of the process. Then we would feed these, um, um, these features into uh, novelty search, and we would ask novelty search to actually generate spaceships that they're very different from the first step, and they're a bit more complex because we would need, we would use NEAT, which is a process, which is a neural evolution process that actually augments the complexity of the neural network. So in the second stage, we will get spaceships that look like that. We will repeat the process, and we will iteratively uh, create more and more complex and refined spaceships that look like, you know, Batman-like or, you know, cool, cool spaceships, spaceships like this one and so on. Um, so by doing so, you actually give the machine the ability to iteratively refine itself and complexify whatever it generates. And then you might have, you know, step by step, you, you, you will end up having more complex and more interesting sort of spaceships that you can render and present to your designer. But all of that is completely autonomous. And um, I would like now to pass into uh, more to, to the creative dialogue between the machine and, and the designer. And I will be talking about briefly about what that is and a number of, a number of examples in that sort of area of creativity between humans and machines, which is called uh, mixed initiative procedural component generation. Which basically you can you can think of it as a sort of slider between human creativity and computational creativity, and um, here you see on the human creativity end you see let's say an example of the Unreal Development Kit, where you have the human has um, as many options when it comes to creativity has many options to design things. Most of the there's a lot of freedom provided by the tool itself. There are a few. Uh, options in the Unreal Development Kit for choosing, let's say, you know, the appropriate AI for uh, the level uh, he or she is designing. But uh, in generally speaking, the the machine itself is not really taking much of an initiative. Um, on the on the other end, towards computational creativity, you meet tools like SpeedTree, 
Whereas, you know, with a few sort of uh, uh, changes, the few selections from the designer, you can have trees or full forests. So computational creativity is really, um, the, the machine is taking the most initiative on that end. And then in between, you will see two tools such as Sentient Sketchbook and uh, Sentient, sentient um, uh, World that will be, re be presenting soon uh, that sit in between human creativity and computational creativity, thereby mixed initiative. So I hope this video plays better because it's generally a slower video. Um, where you see, what, what you see here is basically a designer trying to design uh, a level and he's doing that on a, on a sketch level um, and, it, and it happens, basically mimics the iterative refinement process that I was talking about before. So at the beginning there's a high level sketch and then there's a selection of, of a particular image and then the machine is actually providing a new image or a set of images that they have a higher resolution that the designer can pick from. And then the process continues like that from a very high level to a more sort of, uh, from a very low resolution level to a very high resolution level uh, in, a, in a creative iterative dialogue between uh, the designer and the machine. Uh, you can find, of course, more details in the, <coughs> in the, um, in this paper, in the Sentinel World paper. And um, I will be sharing this, uh, I, will try, I will try to find all these videos actually and sharing it on the Slack channel so that it's, it's convenient for you. Now, the next example is Sentient Sketchbook, which is again the same idea of drawing sketches here on this area, which is um, basically uh, the area where we design a strategy map the designer puts some um, um, basis of a strategy level, some resources, and then there are some impossible areas. And while this is happening, there's some sort of uh, suggestions about particular uh, levels that the designer might want to consider. And all these suggestions or these recommendations are actually optimizing for particular objectives that they're really important for level design, strategy level design in games. Uh, now, some of the recommendations are actually uh, driven by novelty search. So we basically look at whatever a designer is, is doing and we keep the track, the historical, let's say, trail of whatever the designer is doing and we actually try to maximize for the novelty of the levels here, he or she has been designing. So it's basically these last suggestions here. Now, the designer might pick those or might ignore them. In any case, even if the designer ignores those suggestions, uh, we have found from experiments, from evaluation experiments, that actually the very fact that they exist over there and uh, someone can consider them, it, it could act as an inspiration during the creative process, during the design process. Right, so, so the designer is done now. This, the, the sketch is finalized, there are some details that are put over there. And, uh, and then the, the map, the level, the strategy level can be rendered and so on. Once again, I will be sharing the, the links of these videos for your convenience. Now, <clears throat> from Noble Research, we can actually talk, start talking about uh, what we called uh, with Adonis and, uh, and Daniela here, surprise search. So surprise search is, is the idea was inspired by the idea of humans being surprised of, their, of, their, of themselves, of their creations during the creative process. So there's an element of self-surprise during, during creativity that we wanted to replicate or we wanted to actually integrate within an algorithm, within an evolutionary computational algorithm. So what we ended up doing <clears throat> was to actually look at a number of populations in the past and then cluster a number of behaviors. So we look at the history, we look at particular behaviors of the history, and we use these to actually create a model of prediction of where the next behaviors, the expected generation of behaviors is going to end up being. So we predict that, let's say, the next generation is going to be here then we actually have the actual generation or where the actual generation, let's say the behaviors of, of this generation actually are. So 
<clears throat> you can compare between the expected behaviors and the actual behaviors, and then create a model of deviation between the two, and then reward individuals that actually maximize the surprise. So surprise, if you think about it, is the maximization of, is, is let's say, the, 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 the deviation from expected. So um, if, let's say, your generated lever um, maximizes the surprise score, which is it manages to, ex, to, to deviate from what it expects to generate, then that, that seems to be a good thing to have. And from, from experiments in both content generation and robot locomotion, we have, uh, we have showed that uh, it actually, um, surprise is a good idea as, an, as, a, as, a, mechanism, as a mechanism of uh, searching for solutions or creating content um, in games and beyond. So, so we have been using that for, and again, this is another video I will be sharing. We have been using that for, um, for content creation, for generating surprising weapons in games, in first-person shooters, using um, a form of constraint surprise search. So we basically have been maximizing the surprise factor of weapons, but at the same time respecting their, um, their ability to be balanced and, uh, and playable in the game. So we put particular constraints, and within those constraints, we generate as surprising weapons as we possibly can. If you're able to see the video, um, and you will be able to see some sort of balls that they look like a weapon, that they lie there, it's like a minefield. Uh, it's quite effective, but it's also very weird. And this is exactly the effect we want to achieve. We want to actually showcase people that, or designers, that there are, there are possibilities, ultimate possibilities with content generation, things like these that they can look at and be inspired by. Now, <clears throat> taking it a bit further, a step further, is the big question uh, lies, and it's, it's something that we actually investigate in the community of procedural content generation lately, is the very question of how to not only design levels, but at the same time design more than one facet at the same time. Uh, and orchestrate, let's say, levels with rules and sounds and music and so on. So one example, one particular example of, of doing that is to orchestrate levels and weapon design for first-person shooters. So you have levels here of first-person first shooters that we represent using a um, pixel representation that we convolute through a number of uh, convolutional layers. Uh, it goes down to 64 features here on one end, and then on the other end, you have a number of weapons that these guys are using, these agents, uh, the move around, the AI agents that move around uh, in the first person shooter. Uh, and um, these weapons have a, a number of parameters, there are 40, so we're used to 16, and we fuse these two within a common architecture, and we try to predict using uh, quite a lot of data from, from their actions, uh, no, the data of, of two teams actually playing these games, these first-person shooters for, uh, for, for, for a number of simulation steps. What we're trying to predict is whether um, this combination of weapons and level is a balanced one or whether it gives an advantage to team number one or, to a, uh, or it gives an advantage to team number two. Um, it turns out that uh, we can do it pretty well and we can create a surrogate model of this sort of um, combination between levels and weapons and then you can think of now why is that useful well because you might you might have a person in your um, game development department that is uh, capable of designing levels but not really knowing how to use how to design a particular weapon for a particular level so then the algorithm can actually tell the designer that if you if you want to use this level, well, you know, this is the weapon that actually makes this level balance. And the other way around, if you want to use a particular weapon, this is, here's a, a level uh, that actually makes this weapon a balanced one within, within this sort of uh, shooter game. So that's the idea. Uh, creating filters or creating communication channels, let's say, between the different facets of creativity in games. Then I will be, in, my, in the last part of my presentation, I have, I don't know, maybe... 
some time left, I will be jumping from mixed initiative to what is called experience driven. And I'll be talking about a number of, I, I talked about sentient sketchbook already, which is which lies between uh, sort of considers what the designer is doing, but also considers potentially considers what uh, a player is doing once the uh, strategy map uh, is designed. Uh, but um, I will be also giving a number of other examples of what is possible within experience-driven BCG. But first, let me define it. It's basically the framework that sits between modeling the experience of players and content generation, right? So um, we refer it to as a, as a general P PCG framework where content is actually viewed as the building block of player experience. And it uh, lies within uh, the search-based PCG framework. It uses usually evolutionary optimization algorithms or any, any optimization algorithm actually to search the space of content. Uh, and the critical difference between experience-driven and search-based PCG is that experience-driven, it, it actually bases the evaluation functions on experience models of the player. And um, so how is that happening? Well, we'll see about that very soon. So EDPCG is, let's say, what you need to remember from this presentation is the framework, is the idea that we view game content as the building block of player experience. So we can synthesize content so that we produce a particular player experience. And it's uh, the general key uh, components of EDPCG. Uh, you can see them in this figure, it's basically Content is represented in some particular way, either uh, you know directly or all the way indirectly. Like um, uh, let's pick an example. Let's pick a map. A map is represented directly if you if you consider every pixel of the map uh, in your optimization process, uh, and then it is represented completely indirectly if you let's say represent it as a random seed that actually generates a random map, right? Like somewhat like in Minecraft. So <clears throat> then you're looking at, you're searching through the representation uh, from uh, using a, a generator, and a generator can be anything from an exhaustive search mechanism to an evolutionary computation global search algorithm or a gradient search algorithm that actually looks at an experience, player experience model that is used to evaluate the content quality. And then the process goes on and goes on so that particular experiences are generated for the player. But um, by now, I'm sure you have talked quite a lot about various presentations of the content. You have looked at different ways of generating content and different ways of assessing content. Uh, let me focus on this part, the player experience bit, um, and uh, just show you how it can be done in a nutshell. Uh, basically, in general, you have a number of inputs that you can receive from the player, anything from facial expression to physiological data to heat maps to eye tracking data. If you're able to see this video, you would be able to see some sort of white circles. These are, this is the gaze of a Mario player. It's quite useful information for modeling the experience of the player. You could also model speech. This is IDU, by the way. I used to be at IDU some years ago. Um, where we, we held some experiments with uh, facial expression for modeling player experience. And then <clears throat> on the other end, you have labels of any sort. This is, this is in general a supervised learning problem, modeling player experience, or it could be viewed as unsupervised learning. There's not much of reinforcement learning here. Uh, so you have some labels and they come in different uh, forms that you're actually trying to predict using some sort of machine learning algorithm, right? Um, but what I, what I want to talk to you about particularly today is not the AI bit or the input bit because those are there um, and we don't really have a lot of time, but I would like to focus on this one, on this bit, on the output of player experience. Now, there are quite a few questions when it comes to how you think about it. Player experience is a very subjective notion. It's not like um, playtime or uh, you know, number of kills but it's things like frustration, fun, and so on. So the question is, how do, how do I model this? How do I get labels for this thing, which is so subjective? 
And then there are sub-questions such as, who annotates for all this? Uh, when? Who gives the labels? How often? How? And then the labels should be given in an absolute all, all, or in a relative fashion. Um, let me focus on the last question because I just don't have time for the others. And I think the last question is the most interesting one. It's one of the first challenges in psychology. You meet two guys here that are like opposite schools of thought. This guy's uh, name is Fechner, back from the 1860s, uh, suggesting that uh, emotions and subjective notions in psychology should be measured in relative terms. And um, you have this guy later in the 50s, 1950s, uh, <clears throat> that basically suggests uh, uh, with, with his theory that, uh, well, you know what, emotions and subjective um, notions can actually be measured using um, magnitude. So we can actually ask people to give a value for their subjective notions, such as emotion. Uh, so we can actually provide such labels. Um, <clears throat> now, recent evidence suggests from this, this guy is called Damasio, neuroscientist, very, very briefly suggests that our brain actually encodes values in a relative fashion. And then there's other disciplines such as behavioral economics that suggest this is work mainly from Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, but other behavioral economists as well after them. That is by now, it's quite, quite a lot of evidence from several uh, experiments uh, with humans and their decision-making process that is safe to assume that changes are more accessible than absolute values. So collectively, there's theory suggesting and, and practice evidence suggesting that we actually encode subjective notions in, um, in a relative fashion more than in an absolute fashion. Now, when it comes to player experience, you can look at this as what we call the ordinal approach of modeling player experience or emotions of humans within games or beyond. So you can actually look, when, when, we, when we talk about Likert scales, let's say, questionnaires, you can look at the difference between Likert values, not actually their actual magnitude. You can look at different faces and, say, and ask someone to actually indicate which one is happier instead of asking people to indicate how much happy is this face versus this face or whether this face is happy or not. Um, and you can do similar things by basically looking at the relationship between uh, the values that are provided rather than the value itself. Because the value itself, when it comes to subjective notions, is quite irrelevant for what you want to do. So to sum it up, don't use like your skills of, of, or don't, uh, don't ask people to provide values for, for how they feel. This doesn't, doesn't really work very well. Uh, try to do this instead uh, as much as possible. Like if you've been to other summer schools uh, and this one, um, you always maintain a reference point of how good this summer school is, of how good this talk is, opposed to other talks and so on, right? And actually YouTube is doing that quite, uh, started doing that quite recently. And um, there's a lot of marketing research actually suggesting that it's, it's actually best to uh, represent things in relative terms because these labels are far more effective. But let me go into some examples and show you how the, all, these th all these things work uh, within modeling player experience and then I will, will tie it up with procedural point generation for the last bit of my presentation. Now, um, I have this slide and then there's a follow-up video. I'm, I won't be showing the video because I'm sure it won't play well, but I will share it on the Slack channel. Uh, so, but I will tell you a bit about uh, this work. So we recently got a number of data points, um, a, a data set from uh, Massive Entertainment nearby in Malmo. We collaborated with these guys. They have collected um, data from 300 players of uh, uh, Tom Clancy's The Division, uh, their gameplay data, and then on the, on the one end and then on the other end, they had a number of uh, questionnaire responses of a questionnaire they created themselves, and which is basically, which is based on self-determination theory. So players would be asked to actually provide, um, to, to, to let's say rate their levels of autonomy, the levels of uh, 
relatedness, um, and so on. And we actually, we were asked to actually try to predict the level of motivation of a player or the different factors of motivation by playing a game like uh, Tom Clancy's Division, just by looking at the particular gameplay features um, of this game. And it turns out that we can actually do that very well with near certainty. So our models were sort of able to predict player motivation with up to 94 or 96% accuracy. So near certainty uh, because of the very fact that we actually treated those Likert scales as ordinal data and we, we instead converted Likert scales, we ignored their value and we just looked at the relationship between their Likert values, right? So, so essentially by doing that, by following an ordinal approach for, the, for our labels and then following using uh, preference learning, in particular support vector machines, uh, rank support vector machines, we're able to actually achieve those high, high levels of, of accuracy. Because essentially, uh, going back to, to the theory and the evidence, essentially the problem is, is ordinal. When it comes to motivation, when it comes to experience, uh, you cannot possibly expect that a player is able to give you a value of motivation just after he or she finished the game, right? So, yeah, you're welcome. I'm, I'll be sending the video. It's more more uh, visual, of course, describing the whole the full process, which is here. But I'm skipping it. So, I'm going to another example, very recent example that we still not presented. It's going to be presented next month in Cambridge. Uh, what we try to do here is to be able to present to to predict player experience just by looking at the screen of the of the game. Not by, looking at, not by looking at particular game analytics, player analytics, but actually looking at the screen, uh, the pixels of the screen. So as an initial case study, we looked at this sort of survival shooter, uh, sort of um, Unity game, like this with every unit package. And we had players playing those, we have 50, 50 videos of players that they're, they annotated themselves Using, um, using an annotation tool for arousal. And you will see what I'm talking about. So every, every video has, a, let's say, a trace, a line of arousal um, assigned to it. Um, and um, our method, several, a number of deep, deep, uh, deep networks that we tried on this sort of data set. We looked at spatial relationships by using a 2D frame CNN. And we also looked at spatial temporal relationships by considering um, uh, 2D sequential CNNs and 3D CNNs. Now, the idea is to look at the video as input, all the pixels, and then try to predict this arousal value that is annotated by the players. And we initially, we treated this, pr this problem as a classification problem. So we basically try to predict whether the arousal is high or low in a particular moment of the game using this architecture down here, right? So the results are quite, were quite sort of uh, encouraging and very promising actually. Um, by using a very demanding leave one video out method, it's sort of like we are trained on 49 videos and we're trying to predict the, the 50th. It's quite demanding because we have 50 different players uh, we managed to almost reach 80% accuracy. And what you see here is the activation maps of low versus high arousal on a particular, uh, let's say, scene. There's an example scene here. Uh, and what we were able to see is that when high arousal is predicted, uh, there's, there's higher activation for things like the score here and uh, the health bar. And, you know, the, 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 the neural network doesn't really care much about what's going on here in the game, but it rather, rather looks at the score and the health bar. Whereas when, uh, when the arousal is low, when it's predicted that it's low, then uh, the neural network considers the timer and uh, particular aspects of the, of, the, of the gameplay. So it seems that, you know, arousal is low, which means that, you know, uh, things like the the time is, is relevant, whereas when arousal is high, we really focus, the neural networks focus on the score 
and the health bar. These are really interesting results for explaining what's going on with player experience in simple games like that. And it's also fascinating that you can actually, without looking at the player, completely ignoring the player, but just looking at the play, and the pixels of the play, you can infer what is the level of arousal in a game uh, using a deep uh, network um, architecture. Um, then, yeah, I believe I have like maybe five minutes more and I'll show you some examples that you can actually see, hopefully skipping. There's a QA here, let me see. Oh, okay, good. I'll respond to that later on. So let me, let me show you some more examples and then I will, I will get back to uh, the QA session. Um, right, so just to save time, I'll just go directly here and show you a quite uh, early example of, uh, that we used with Julian uh, as the, the base of the experience-driven PCG framework, which, is, which was on Mario, obviously, back then. Um, what we did was to capture, to actually ask thousands, hundreds of players to play different levels of Mario, and we would record their game, anal game um, behavior in terms of analytics uh, by extracting a number of features. We would also record, um, we would log particular features of the level design, such as the number of gaps, uh, how wide the gaps are, and so on. And then we would also use some other features like, uh, uh, as you see here, uh, video, uh, the video feed of players that we could extract visual cues such as the head pose or how far away they are from the screen and so on. And we would use all this information to actually predict whether uh, they are frustrated, they are engaged and so on, or they are challenged. And those labels for frustration and engagement we would get in a pairwise format, in a relative format. And then once we have models, neural network models of frustration and engagement that map between player behavior, um, level design and experience, we can actually change the level parameters to maximize, let's say, for the frustration of players or, or for their engagement and so on. So it's basically uh, sort of closing the full cycle of predicting the player's feelings um, experience that is associated with particular content and then searching within the content representation to find appropriate content that maximizes or minimizes particular player experiences, right? As we saw before. Um, now, another interesting example, uh, an interesting sort of uh, prototype or proof of concept is this idea that you can actually change the game design, uh, not for the sake of changing the game design or changing the level, but for the sake of changing something about the behavior of the agent. So to be more precise, uh, we did an experiment of changing the um, levels of Super Mario, of adapting, of generating levels, so that the Mario agent is actually looking more believable. We didn't change the agent per se, but we changed the, the environment. So what you see in these two videos, hopefully, let's see. Is the same A star agent that plays two different levels. One is maximized so that the A star looks more believable. Right, and that one would be the right video that just finished. Um, and how did we do that? Well, we again asked many people to actually see videos of A star agents playing Super Mario uh, Bros. Uh, uh, games or various human players that would play different levels and then we'd ask them to rank their levels of believability and then um, we would change and then, then we have those relationships between agent believability and level design so we could vary the level design so that they look, so that the agent looks more believable or, or a particular human actually looks more human-like, right? 
as the idea. So it's basically reframing the problem of uh, agent believability uh, by looking at the environment of the agent rather than the agent controller itself. Now, my last example, and I think I will be done for today, is what we call Sonancia. And again, I'm sorry, so this is a video I will be sharing. But this is an idea. The idea is that um, a designer provides uh, a specific curve, tension curve. Let's say it draws a curve like this one or this one, like, like Aristotelian, let's say, curve, or a Brazilian soap opera curve of tension. And that is provided as initial seed to the system. And, and then the system is actually trying to generate levels with corresponding sounds that try to um, sort of fit this curve as much as possible, uh, the tension curve. And you might ask, okay, how is that possible? Uh, how do you actually model tension? Again, in the same way as we did before, we crowdsource particular musical uh, sound effects, let's say, or music. Uh, in this particular example, Sonantia actually generates levels for horror type of games and corresponding music, of course. So we crowdsourced horror-like sound effects and we were able to find the global ranking of uh, tension within, within horror. And we use that global ranking to, um, to place different sounds within different rooms in, in mansion type games, as you will hopefully be able to see in this video. So let's, this is an example. Uh, so you provide the tension curve and then the system generates a level and its corresponding sounds, it's horror. Yeah, let's see. Oh. Right. Who knows how to play? No. Interesting. Right. Let's see. Ah, uh, here it is. So again, I don't know how much you're able to see here. If you are able to see this, is the mansion type horror game. I will just pump up the, the sound a bit. Hopefully you can hear the sound. So I hope you got the idea. Again, I will be sending this video. Uh, so the idea is that every sound is placed on the, you know, the, 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 the level generated, the number of rooms is generated based on the tension curve uh, of how often you meet particular enemies and what you have to do. And uh, on top of that, we place sounds so that we match the tension curve provided by the designer. So we're talking about another mix initiative tool that, is, that works, it's, it's a lower initiative from uh, let's say the designer here, because the designer just specifies a curve, um, and the rest is made by the by the machine. So, my last two slides is basically a number of tools that you can use for for this summer school that you might want to use. Uh, things that I've been talking about today. So the first one is uh, what we call the Python Preference Learning Toolbox. It's basically it features a number of uh, preference learning algorithms, such as um, and, it, and it connects to TensorFlow. So algorithms such as uh, rank SVMs and uh, you know standard backpropagation or deep neural networks, RankNet, um, and at this point at least, but we are also uh, uh, considering adding you know random forest decision trees and so on. So every basically every supervised learning algorithm that you can think of can be converted to preference learning algorithm that basically learns from ordinal relationships from pairwise preferences like like the experience uh, labels I was talking about. So the tool basically features 
um, pre-processing data, pre-processing steps, and uh, feature selection algorithms, and uh, a number of preference learning algorithms, and also autoencoders for uh, for sort of uh, compressing your data before uh, they enter um, um, other layers of the neural network. Now, it's quite robust as it stands, and there's there are two versions, one with uh, graphical user interface, as you see here, and one without. You're welcome to use any and uh, give us your feedback. Now, the second tool is what we call the Pagan uh, platform for the visual general purpose annotation. As you see over here is basically, um, if you have videos of gameplay and you want to annotate them with regards to arousal, tension, uh, excitement, fun, whatever label you might want to, to track, then you can use this tool, generate projects, you know, upload your you, 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 uh, YouTube videos and annotate them uh, or just just play, record your, your gameplay, and then annotate your experience, and then use your, these videos to do a research with, um, with player experience, as we did, uh, uh, as I presented before, with uh, modeling player experience. So I believe Niels has already shared these two tools. Welcome to use them, give us feedback, and yeah, let us know what you think. Um, yeah, you know all about this by now. The number, chapter number four is quite useful as an uh, introduct introduction to, um, to procedural content generation. And, uh, oh, I have one more slide here. Yeah, and uh, as this summer school, myself and Julian have, have been organizing a number of, of uh, another summer school on uh, dedicated to artificial intelligence and games beyond procedural content generation. Well, basically anything that has to do with AI and games. Um, Last year, we'd organized it in, in Hanya here in Crete. Uh, well, two years ago, actually. Last year, it was in, in New York. And next year, most likely, it's going to be in, in Copenhagen. So watch out for this in this space if you're interested uh, to know more about AI and games in general. So that would be me. Uh, thank you very much. And then thank you very much for listening to this. And I will be jumping into... Uh, uh, let me see. So the first question, let me see, I'm, I'm at the, right, okay. So I'm reading the first question. So the first question is in the QA here by Carlos, is how do you annotate the arousal values initially in the survival shooter. Um, now, the, the, the values uh, are annotated using the Pagan tool that I was talking about just, just before. So it's a tool that actually you can use to upload your videos uh, uh, of gameplay and then ask the players themselves to annotate their arousal traces over time, the continuous trace over time, or you can ask designers to actually annotate that, anyone else, or you can actually crowdsource various arousal traces for every video. It's up to, up to you how you want to do it, but the tool is over there. If you want, uh, you're welcome to, to try it out. So I consider that as done. Then, but if you have a follow-up question, please, please go ahead, Carlos. So, Right, so the next one is by Philip, and it goes like, I recently ran a study using self-assessment mannequin for evaluating specific AI animation behavior. The results were massively variant, which confused me. How do you identify reliable measure for human evaluation? I've ended up not really trusting these measures due to my experience. That's a very valid point, actually. Um, it is, uh, your question is, is the very reason why I never personally used um, like your type questionnaires or of, of like self-assessment mannequins for my research. And I instead uh, used uh, relative measures 
for uh, for labeling labeling emotions, experience of players, and so on. So I think it would be really useful for you, and so you're welcome to to take this over an email uh, if you want to to uh, to read. Uh, um, and I'm not sure if if we can actually share the slides here, Niels, or anyhow, I can share the slides over. I, I can send the slides to Niels, so you can actually have. Uh, pointers to all the papers, but I would suggest you to read the Ordinal Nature of Emotions paper that is, uh, that is cited in, in my slides when I talk about the relative uh, nature of emotions. Um, it's quite a lengthy paper with references to all the works and the different ways to actually process uh, labels um, in a relative fashion. Reliability, to your question, reliability has a number of different ways to be measured through Cronbach's alpha and so on, but uh, using Likert scales or using self-assessment uh, mannequin uh, sort of uh, labels. But in general, I would argue that it's, it's better for you not, uh, if you can, not to use uh, this type of uh, constructs. Uh, from my experience, they are not very reliable, they are not uh, valid, and they are not quite, they don't really produce generalizable models. So yeah, please go ahead and read that paper. I'm happy to follow this up with uh, over, over email. I'll, I'll just, uh, as Amy did, I'll just share my email uh, once I'm done with this. Thank you. Uh, so Daniel asks, have you used EBA, which stands for uh, ele electro, uh, what is that? This, phys uh, this is physiology. Uh, electrodermal activity, yep. Have you used the electrodermal activity sensors for arousal or just video analysis? Um, I've been using EDA sensors in the past, skin conductance sensors. Um, we have also been using um, video analysis or just plain game metrics, player metrics, to measure arousal or model it through neural networks or other models. Um, so my experience tells me that the more reliable form of modality when it comes to games for modeling human affect and human emotion is the way people play. Uh, I think EDA is a wonderful way to access arousal of humans, but as you might know, it has several limitations and uh, it creates quite noisy um, signals that uh, in turn uh, yield models of uh, questionable sort of um, accuracy and generalizability. So I would say that uh, EDA is a good idea if you can trust the signals that you get. Uh, also EDA is quite, quite expensive because you need to you need to plug people with, with sensors and that is quite expensive. It costs quite a lot, especially in a user testing uh, department. Uh, sometimes you can't just afford that. Uh, but uh, on the other end, it actually gives you access to more data um, about human behavior that, that could be useful. It could be useful indeed. I, don't, I just don't want to, to sound very... Uh, very negative here, but uh, EDA has its challenges and its its weaknesses and its sort of strengths, of course. Um, I've been so to be short again. I've been using it. We have been using it in our experiments. It works to a degree. Uh, it works best if you combine it with gameplay metrics. Um, and I consider that done. Um, 